Okay, so hi everyone. Today we are going to be talking about a very important neuromuscular junction disorder that is myasthenia gravis. So I've uploaded my notes for myasthenia gravis as well as Lambert Yerton syndrome on Neuraxis Pro. So I've uploaded these notes on Neuraxis Pro. I put the link in the description so you can go ahead and access my notes over there. And I've also uploaded my class on cerebral venous thrombosis in Neuraxis Pro. Okay, now let's go into the class. So, myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder that is characterized by fluctuating weakness and fatigability of the skeletal muscles because of reduced availability of acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, and just remember that the acetylcholine receptor is going to have 5 subunits. Okay, this is important for the exam. So, there's 2 alpha subunits, 1 beta, 1 delta, 1 gamma and 1 epsilon. And remember that acetylcholine is going to bind at the alpha subunit. Okay, that's where it's going to bind. That's an important question. Okay, now let's have a simple pictorial representation of the neuromuscular junction. So, here we have the presynaptic region. So, this is the presynaptic region. And this is going to be the postsynaptic muscle membrane. This is the postsynaptic muscle membrane. So what happens is, at the presynaptic terminal, we have voltage-gated calcium channel and we have vesicles, numerous vesicles that are filled with acetylcholine. Filled with acetylcholine. So what happens is, once the action potential is coming down the presynaptic region, it stimulates the voltage-gated calcium channel. So this causes calcium ion influx into the presynaptic terminal. So this calcium in turn, it causes release of acetylcholine from these presynaptic vesicles. So now acetylcholine has entered into the neuromuscular junction. And at the postsynaptic muscle membrane, we are going to have your acetylcholine receptors. We have your acetylcholine receptors. So this ACH is going to bind to these acetylcholine receptors. So when it binds to the acetylcholine receptors, it's going to give rise to a local potential, not an action potential, a local potential which is known as end plate potential. And when you have enough number of acetylcholine receptors stimulated, these end plate potentials finally come together to form an action potential. And this action potential propagates along the postsynaptic muscle membrane, eventually causing skeletal muscle contraction. So this is a simplified uh, diagram showing what's going on in the neuromuscular junction. So where is the problem in myasthenia gravis? So in myasthenia gravis, where is the problem? So we have antibodies that are directed towards these acetylcholine receptors. Okay, so what do these antibodies do to the ACH receptors? So number one, they're going to cause complement mediated. They're going to cause complement mediated injury to the postsynaptic muscle membrane. Number two, they're going to block the binding site of the acetylcholine receptor, preventing acetylcholine from binding to it. And number three, it's going to cause increased turnover of the acetylcholine receptors because of antibody-mediated endocytosis and cross-linking. Okay, so this is what's happening in myasthenia gravis. So you can see from here, myasthenia gravis is a postsynaptic NMG disorder. It is a postsynaptic NMG disorder. So what are the presynaptic NMG disorders? So just like your antibodies over here, you can have antibodies that are directed to the voltage-gated calcium channel. So that is known as, so that is known as lambert eaton syndrome. So that is known as lambert eaton syndrome. Okay, so I've uh, uploaded notes for lambert eaton syndrome on Neuraxis Pro and I'll also, up, also be uploading the class for it on Neuraxis Pro. So the other presynaptic disorders, are botulism. Okay, so you've heard of Botox toxin. So remember, Botox toxin is a presynaptic toxin. It prevents these acetylcholine vesicles from getting released. Okay, and the other presynaptic NMJ toxin is going to be neurotoxic snake bite. Neurotoxic snake bite. So these are the different disorders of the neuromuscular junction. Now let's let's discuss further about myasthenia gravis. So coming to the antibodies in myasthenia gravis. So we have discussed right now, anti-acetylcholine receptors are the main antibodies. 
they are diagnostic of mycenae gravis your diagnostic of mycenae gravis and they are seen in 85 percentage of all mycenae gravis patients but however only in 50 percent of ocular mycenae patients the next important body is going to be anti musk that is anti muscle specific kinase antibody so this is seen in 10 percent of all mycenae patients however in zero negative patients those patients who are negative for anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies in that scenario anti musk is seen in 40 percent of these patients and the special clinical features of anti musk antibody is number one they're going to cause predominant cranial and bulbar weakness they're going to cause pre predominant cranial and bulbar weakness and they cause muscle atrophy okay so that these are two important clinical clues telling us that it could be anti musk mg and remember that they worsen with anti acetylcholine esterase therapy so remember the initial drug that we're going to use for mycenae gravis are these drugs that is pyridostigmin so drugs like pyridostigmin and neostigmin will not have any effect on anti musk antibody disease they would rather worsen the weakness in this scenario it's a very very important mcq question now what are the other antibodies just remember the names for the exam so we have anti lrp4 that is lipoprotein receptor related protein 4 seen in 1 to 3 percent of cases anti agrin another important ex uh, exam oriented question over here is anti striated muscle antibody so remember this if this antibody is positive it's highly likely there is an underlying thymoma okay it's highly likely that there is an underlying thymoma so around 70 to 80 percent of patients who are positive for this okay rather 70 to 80 percent of patients with thymoma are going to have this antibody so remember anti striated muscle antibody probably there's an underlying thymoma next is anti netrin 1 and anti casper 2 remember that these two antibodies are going to coexist they are also present in patients with thymoma not only in mycenae gravis but also in patients who are having neuromyotonia and morvan syndrome okay so this is important for the exam now coming to the epidemiology so the prevalence is around 200 to 100, uh, 200 for every 100000 population and as a bimodal distribution so you have an early onset mycenae gravis that usually occurs at 20 to 30 years and it's common in female patients and then we have a late onset mycenae gravis that is seen 50 to 60 years more commonly in males and remember that juvenile mycenae gravis is more common in asia and the other subtype of mycenae gravis which is common in asia is ocular ocular mycenae gravis so ocular mycenae gravis and juvenile mycenae gravis both are common in asian population and since it's an autoimmune disorder it's obviously more common in female patients at a ratio of 3 to 2 and 20 percent of patients are going to attain a sustained remission and the mortality with modern treatment is pretty less it's only one to two percentage and even though mycenae gravis doesn't fall uh, doesn't follow a mendelian inheritance pattern family members of patients are thousand times more likely to develop mycenae gravis compared to the general population so now coming to the clinical features so i'll just discuss the general clinical features and then we'll discuss in detail about each and every clinical subtype so the classical description of mycenae gravis is going to be a fluctuating weakness that worsens with activity okay so the patient will be okay in the morning but as the patient does more and more uh, more and more uh, more and more work it's going to worsen the weakness so fluctuating weakness that worsens with activity or worsens throughout the day so initially the symptoms are going to be restricted to the bulbar muscle so the cranial or cranial weakness is going to be predominant so patient will be presenting with ptosis and diplopia but by around two to three years the patient will start developing generalized weakness okay 80 to 85 percent of the patients will eventually uh, eventually develop weakness of the other muscles also okay and other other signs of uh, or other symptoms of bulbar weakness are going to be dysphagia dysarthria and limb weakness as i told you sometimes 10% of the time the presentation itself can be limb weakness but usually it starts with a bulbar weakness then progressing to a generalized weakness and the muscles which are preferentially involved are going to be your neck, neck flexors, deltoid, triceps, extensors of the wrist and fingers and the ankle dorsiflexors. So these muscle groups are important for the exam. Another very very important exam oriented question is the deep tendon reflexes are preserved in mycenae gravis. So this is in contrast to lambert yetten syndrome where deep tendon reflexes are going to be absent or reduced so remember dtrs are going to be preserved in myasthenia now let's go into the clinical subtypes now coming to ocular myasthenia gravis so this is seen in 10 to 15 percent of the cases so as we discussed earlier it's common in the asian population just like juvenile mg which is common in the asian population so as we discussed earlier 
the weakness is initially going to start in the extra ocular muscles or is going to start as bulbar weakness but usually by 1 to 2 years it's going to progress to involve other muscles but when the weakness is going to be confined to the extra ocular muscles for a period of 3 years or more that is the definition for ocular myasthenia gravis so initial presentation is going to be ptosis and diplopia and a very very important question the most commonly and most significantly involved involved muscle is going to be your medial rectus and because of this chronic ptosis the patient is going to compensate for that by chronic contraction of the frontalis muscle so give this gives a patient a worried or a surprised look another important question for the exam is peak sign so what happens in peak sign is due to muscle fatigue even when the patient attempts to keep the eyes closed there will be some slight involuntary opening of the eyes that is the patient cannot voluntarily fully close his eyes so this is peak sign so you can see after a, due to muscle fatigue even though the patient is trying to close his eyes he is not able to do so fully okay so this is known as peak sign very very important for the exam okay now let's come to the most common type that is generalized myasthenia gravis 80 to 85% of patients are going to have generalized myasthenia gravis so as we discussed earlier we have early onset myasthenia which occurs less than 40 years it predominantly affects female patients and these patients tend to be zero positive or positive for anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies and they tend to have thymic abnormalities like thymoma or thymic hyperplasia late onset myasthenia gravis is usually seen after 40 years most commonly involving male patients and these patients tend to are tend to be positive for anti striated muscle antibodies so as we discussed earlier this antibody is very commonly present in thymoma and also these patients are going to have more severe weakness with very frequent myasthenic crises okay now coming to the thymic abnormalities or what is thymomatous myasthenia gravis so this is seen in 10% of patients that is 10% of patients are going to have thymoma but what are the other thymic abnormalities in myasthenia gravis so the thymus is going to be abnormal in 75% of the time in zero positive myasthenia gravis is an important mcq so in this 75% 65% they are going to have thymic hyperplasia and 10% of all myasthenic patients are going to have thymoma okay and incidence of thymoma is an equal sex distribution and has a peak onset at around 50 years of age Yes. Now coming to the very important variant or subtype that is anti-musk antibody positive myasthenia gravis. So it's ten percent of all myasthenia patients, and it is more common in zero negative myasthenia myasthenic patients. So around forty percent of zero negative, that is anti-acetylcholine receptor negative, generalized myasthenia gravis patients are going to be positive for anti-musk antibodies. Females are more commonly involved, and as we discussed earlier, they're going to have a predominant cranial and bulbar muscle weakness. and the disease severity is more worse than anti ach receptor antibody positive mg and the other clinical feature is patients are going to have muscle atrophy so don't forget patients are going to have cranial and bulbar weakness patients are going to have muscle atrophy and another important point your uh, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors like pyridostigmine or neostigmine are not going to help they are rather going to worsen the weakness in these patients so the primary treatment over here is going to be immunotherapy okay and a drug that is specifically useful for anti mus diseases rituximab so rituximab has good efficacy in anti mus antibody positive myasthenic gravis is important mcq question and thymic abnormalities are very rare in anti mus disease okay that is why thymectomy is contraindicated if the patient is positive for anti mus antibodies now coming to zero negative myasthenia so what is zero negative if the patient is both Anti acetylcholine receptor antibody negative and also anti anti musk negative. So this is known as double zero negative. So around ten percent of the patients are going to be double zero negative, both anti ACHR and anti musk negative. Next, coming to the life threatening complication of myasthenia, that is myasthenic crisis. So myasthenic crisis is nothing when the myasthenic weakness is going to cause respiratory failure, requiring mechanical ventilation support. Okay. and the most common trigger or most common cause for myasthenic crisis is going to be infections very very important mcq so most common trigger is going to be an infection and what is the best measure of respiratory function in this scenario it's going to be negative inspiratory force and when the negative inspiratory force is less than minus 20 the patient might require mechanical ventilation so that's about the clinical uh, subtypes and variants now let's go into the diagnosis
So a simple diagnostic test which can be done in the clinic is an ice pack test. So you're going to go ahead and place an ice pack over the eyelid which is having ptosis for a period of 2 minutes. So remember here, it's not diagnostic of Mycenae gravis but it has a very high, very high negative predictive value. Next are serum antibodies. So we have already discussed this earlier in detail, not going into it again. Now coming to tensilon test. So this is important. So we have tensilon test. Okay, tensilon is nothing but edrophonium chloride. So what we do in tensilon test is, it has a very specific indication. So, whenever you have myceny patients who are negative for your anti anti uh, sorry, anti uh, acetylcholine receptor antibodies and who do not have a diagnostic, electrodiagnostic testing, but still your clinical suspicion for myceny graves is very high, in those scenarios you can try tensilon. So, what we do is, first we give 2 milligrams IV of tensilon. So, remember tensilon is a rapidly acting cholinesis inhibitor, always load atropin and keep in hand, okay, because sometimes patients can go for severe secretions, bradycardia, so always you have to load atropin and keep while doing tensilon test. So, after giving 2 mg IV, you have to assess for the response. If the patient is improving, ptosis is coming down, that means it's a positive test. That means the patient is having, most probably having mycin gravis. But if the patient's weakness is going to worsen, if the patient's weakness is going to worsen, you have to think of a cholinergic crisis. So, tensilon test also helps us to differentiate between cholinergic crisis and mycinic crisis. Next, if the patient is going to have a negative response, nothing is happening, you again can add another 8 mg. You can add another 8 mg of hydrophonium and then reassess the response. If the patient is still not having any response, probably the test is negative. Okay, so the question they can ask over here is, what is the total dose that we give? So along with this initial 2 mg and the 8 mg you're going to give later, the total dose used for tensilon test is 10 mg of hydrophonium. Okay, 10 mg of hydrophonium. So this is the tensilon test. Here you can see an asymmetrical ptosis involving the right eye. So after giving tensilon, the patient's ptosis improved. Okay, so probably the patient is having mycenae gravis. But the problem is, it's not very specific. So, you have a lot of false positive tensilon test. And the two important reasons that are given in Harrison's is motor neuron disease and placebo reactors. So, don't forget this for the exam. The other causes of false positive tensilon are going to be congenital mycenae gravis, lambert eaton syndrome, intracranial aneurysms, brainstem lesions, cavernous sinus tumors, and end-stage renal disease. Okay, now coming to electrodiagnostic tests. Okay, so we have repetitive nerve stimulation. So when repetitive nerve stimulation is done at a low frequency, like at around 3 hertz, you're going to get a decremental response. Very, very important question. You're going to get a decremental response of at least 10 percentage. Okay, but however, the most sensitive investigation in Mycenae gravis is going to be your single fiber electromyography. This you should not forget. Okay, the answer is not RNS or the answer is not repetitive nerve stimulation. The most sensitive is going to be single fiber electromyography and here we are going to look for jitter. We are going to look for blocking and jitter. Okay, remember this word jitter, very very important for the exam. Okay, now coming to myasthenia gravis and pregnancy. Okay, so we are going to have first trimester worsening. So worsening of MG or myasthenia gravis in the first trimester worsening is common in the first pregnancies. However, in subsequent pregnancies, third trimester or postpartum worsening is more common. And the drug of choice is just like for non-pregnant patients, it's going to be pyridostigmine. And the immunosuppressant of choice is going to be prednisolone because your mycophenolate morphotil is highly tetragenic. And even acetoyaprine, even though it does have some degree of safety in pregnancy, it's best to avoid it. And very, very important, in myasthenic patients who are going to develop preeclampsia, do not give magnesium sulfate. Remember, magnesium sulfate is a neuromuscular block, uh, blocking agent. It will worsen the weakness in mycenae gravis. So, in this scenario, instead of magnesium sulfate, you can go for barbage rates. So, always remember, preeclampsia patients with myasthenia don't give magnesium sulfate. Now, what are the other associated disorders? So, most important one is going to be hyperthyroidism. So, 3 to 8 percent of patients are going to have hyperthyroidism. And remember, hyperthyroidism can worsen myasthenic weakness. The other uh, associated disorders are Devix disease, neuromyotonia, Morvin syndrome, diabetes mellitus in 7% of patients, extra thymic neoplasms in 3%, rheumatoid arthritis very rarely, only 2%, and other autoimmune disorders like SLE and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Okay, very important. So, what are the drugs that you are going to avoid in mycenae gravis? Number one, antibiotics. 
So it's very important to know what antibiotics not to give in myasthenia gravis because the most common cause of myasthenic uh, crisis is going to be an intercurrent infection. So it's very, uh, very important that you cautious, uh, cautiously choose antibiotics in this scenario. So the antibiotics you should avoid are going to be aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones and macrolides. So don't forget these group of antibiotics. Next, obviously non-depolarizing skeletal muscle relaxants like atracurium and vecuronium. Then beta blockers, local anesthetics like procainamide, obviously Botox. And then your quinine groups like quinine, quinidine, chloroquine, mefloquine and very very important magnesium. That's why you should not give magnesium sulfate in pregnant mycenia patients who are having preeclampsia. Another very very important question is, what drug is going to cause de novo myasthenia gravis. It's going to cause new onset myasthenia gravis. It's going to be D penicillin. Very, very important question. The other uh, drug that causes de novo myasthenia gravis is going to be your checkpoint inhibitors, but don't forget D penicillin. So, how are you going to treat myasthenia gravis? So, you can treatment can be because of, uh, can be by acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitors, your immunotherapy, and thymectomy. We'll discuss each in detail. So, acetylcholine recept, uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, what they're going to do is, they are going to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. So, causing increased availability of acetylcholine. So, it can act on more acetylcholine receptors. So, this is what's the mechanism of action. And the drug of choice in this group is going to be pyridostigmine. The dose is 30 to 60 mg per uh, 3 times or 4 times a day up to a maximum dose of 300 mg per day. For children, you have pyridostigmine syrups also which are available. The dose is 1 mg per kg. 1 mg per kg. So, what are the common side effects? Just like your OPC poisoning, you don't have all those features like nausea, vomiting, loose stools, all of these are cholinergic features. So, increased bronchial and oral secretions. And because pyridostigmine comes as pyridostigmine bromide in very high doses, it can cause bromism. Okay, so bromism presents as acute psychosis. That's an MCQ question. And remember, do not give pyridostigmine in patients who are anti musk positive because this will worsen weakness. Okay, now coming to immunotherapy. So, coming to immediate immunotherapy, the two important treatment modalities are intravenous immunoglobulin, same dose as gulin syndrome, it's 2 grams per kg, which is split over 2 to 5 days, and then we have plasma exchange. So, in which scenario are going to use this? So, number one, when you need to immediately get rid of all these antibodies, and that is going to be during myasthenic crisis. So, that's, be go that's going to be during myasthenic crisis. Next, preoperatively. Okay, preoperatively, you got to get rid of those antibodies. And number three, when you're starting steroid therapy, especially when you're going to start with high-dose steroids, there will be an initial worsening of weakness. So, in that scenario, you can go for your IVIG or plasma exchange. So, these are the scenarios where you have to use these drugs. Now, coming to intermediate, the most important drug in this group is going to be your steroids. So, uh, start with a low dose of steroids because the problem is when you're starting with a high dose of steroids, it's going to initially worsen the weakness. So, start at around 15 to 25 mg per day and then slowly increase it up to 60 mg per day or till you are going to get clinical improvement. Then after that, you have to slowly taper steroids till you reach the minimum effective dose. Till you reach the minimum effective dose. But the problem with steroids is it has a wide array of complications. Glaucoma, cataract, hypertension, diabetes, peptic ulcer. So, the problem is you might have to use steroid sparing agents. Okay. So, we have cyclosporin which is given a dose of 4 to 5 mg per kg per day and tacrolimus is given at a dose of 0.07 to 0.1 mg per kg per day. So, these are the intermediate acting immunosuppressive therapy. Now, coming to the long term. So, these will take months for the onset of action to start. The important drugs over here are going to be azathioprine. Very important. So, it started at a dose of 50 mg per day, slowly increased up to a dose of 2 to 3 mg per kg per day or till the total leukocyte count is 3000 to 4000. Another very highly effective drug over here is mycophenolate mofetil. So, it inhibits de novo purin synthesis and it is a very safe drug. It has very few complications like some minimal GI toxicity like nausea and vomiting and it can cause some leukopenia. The problem is it is extremely teratogenic. So, you cannot use it for pregnant patients. The dose is 1 to 1 1.5 grams twice a day. And rituximab has a very very specific indication in Mycenae gravis. It is used for anti-musk positive cases. Okay, so it's a monoclonal antibody against CD20. The dose is around 1 gram intravenously given on two occasions, two weeks apart. The other drugs that can be used are eclizumab. The problem is it is extremely costly. And the drug of choice for refractory myasthenia gravis is going to be cyclophosphamide. That's an important MCQ. Okay, coming to another important uh, 
question for competitive exams what are the indications of thymectomy in myasthenia gravis so number one obviously when the patient is going to have thymoma so 10 percent of myasthenic patients are going to have thymoma that is an absolute indication the other indications are going to be zero positive that is anti acetylcholine receptor positive generalized myasthenia gravis patients who are aged 18 above and less than 65 years of age the contraindications are going to be more than 65 years of age anti musk positive myasthenia gravis and ocular myasthenia gravis so these are the three important contraindications okay so i think i've uh, covered most of the important points thank you